Hello, my name is Lucas Mann, and I pastor the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina. And friends, I come down here this morning to uh, to plead with you, to beg that you would not do this evil thing, that you would not take the life of your child. I also come out here to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to exalt Christ and to offer Him as He is offered in the gospel, and to to plead with you likewise to come to Christ as I myself have in others, that you might have eternal life in Him. For He said Himself in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Me. Friends, there is only one way of salvation, it is through Christ. And I come here this morning to make known what Christ has done for His people. And to call you to believe upon Him alone for salvation. I call upon you today to forsake your beloved sin and to forsake this sin which you have set out this morning to commit. And that is the sin of abortion. For God Himself has said you shall not murder. And that is certainly what abortion is. Taking the life of the innocent. Friends, do not do this evil thing against God. Rather, come to Christ that the love of God might be shed abroad in your hearts. Cease being God-haters and come and be adopted as the children of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. I come here to make known to you also the reality of God's wrath against sin, that you might fear Him, that you might fear the wrath which is to come. For God has fixed a day, He has set a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness. And friends, if you continue on in your life of sin and you continue on in your rebellion against the Lord Jesus Christ, then on that day you will be found guilty. You will be found wanting. And by that point it will be too late. And you will be punished forever in hell for your sins. I know this from Scripture and that's why I come out here. I care for you. I don't want this to happen to you. I don't want you to be in this state. I don't want you to lose your soul for your sin. And so I say in the words of my Lord, come. In the words of Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 55, come. In the words of the book of Revelation in the last chapter, in chapter 22, come. Come freely to Christ that you might have life. I come to make known this gospel, this gospel of grace, that Christ likewise might be glorified, that He might be praised and honored, that He might receive the glory that is due to Him for what He has done for His people. For He has come to save His people from their sins. And He has done that. He has purchased their redemption. And so by preaching this gospel, I seek to exalt Christ, to lift up His name at this place, this house of death. So therefore may Christ be glorified as the Word is preached, as the gospel of grace is made known. And the text of Scripture that I would like to preach on this morning, to direct your attention to, is found in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, the Apostle Paul is writing here concerning salvation and specifically how Abraham was saved. He says in verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's what I want to preach on this morning. To expose it, to explain to you what this means. What this passage means. Because it carries with it great meaning. Friends, I have said thus far that you can be saved by coming to Christ. But we ask ourselves, it is, is it by Christ some and some of my own effort? Is it by some law keeping and some of what Jesus has done? 
Is it by 90% of the work of Christ in 10% of my effort? Friends, I'm here to tell you that it is all of grace. It is all of grace. It is all of Christ, 100%. And Paul here brings to our, uh, our attention the life of Abraham. Abraham's conversion is an example of how salvation is by faith alone. In the promise of God. The promise of God that He gave that He would save all those who came to His Son. It is by faith alone in Christ alone. And even Abraham, the great patriarch of the Old Testament, was saved just as people are saved today. By faith in the seed of the woman. By faith in Christ, the Son of God. And so therefore I call you, you sinners, to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. To believe upon the Son of God that you might have life in Him. For Jesus Himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me will live even if He dies. Oh friends, and I call you that because I truly care for you. Listen to this. This is important. Your soul is at stake. Be as Abraham. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and say, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. And so I want to explain to you in this sermon how Abraham had been saved. That it was by faith alone. His conversion was wrought by faith alone. Before I do that, of course, the context here of Romans 4, Paul is speaking, as I said earlier, on salvation. He just finished up in chapter 3 saying that we are saved by faith. He says in verse 28, For we maintain that as man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Friends, do not think that you can offer up to God good works to somehow persuade Him to let you enter into heaven. None of the labor of your hands can suffice. Nothing you do can save yourself. Especially as you heap sin upon sin in your own lives. As you are here this day to commit murder. God will look past the so-called good works that you have and see your sin. And see your sexual immorality. See your lying and your thievery. He will see your murder that you have committed if you go through with this evil deed today and you will be punished for it. The only way such sins can be removed is by Christ, is by the redemptive work of Christ, is by falling upon Christ for grace. And Paul says that in verse 23 of Romans 3, or in verse 28 of Romans 3, that we are saved by faith. And then Romans 4 is all about the life of Abraham. Paul uses it as an example, as an illustration of this glorious truth, this precious doctrine of justification by faith alone. He points to, uh, points to this man, this patriarch, who was often spoken of in the Old Testament texts. And he says, look, here is this man. He was saved by faith. Paul could have used many examples from the early church, but he goes back all the way to Genesis. The beginning part of the book of Genesis. The first book of the Bible itself. And shows us that salvation from the beginning was by faith in the seed of the woman. Namely, Christ. So that brings us to the beginning of chapter 4 and verse 1. So let's consider Abraham's conversion. Abraham's conversion. Verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? Paul, being a Jew, therefore was a descendant of Abraham. We know that God in the Old Testament had set apart Abraham to be the father of many nations, to be, as we might say, the first Jewish man who had been set apart by God for a specific purpose. And we know from the greater narrative of Scripture that God set him apart to become a nation, 
so that he might bring about the birth of the Messiah into the world who would bring salvation to all men. But nonetheless, Paul himself was a Jew and he says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? In other words, let's go back to the beginning. This first man of the nation of Israel, we might say, the head of the nation of Israel, the beginning. Let's see what happened to him. Let us hear his testimony. Though he has been dead for many generations, let us see what the timeless scriptures have spoken. Verse 2, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. The argument Paul is making here is that Abraham had been saved by keeping the law, then he would have had something to boast about. He would have had something to boast in. He would have had some religious performance concerning which he could have said, yes, I have done good enough. I have performed sufficiently and therefore I will be given entrance. I will be granted entrance into the kingdom of God. However, Paul negates it at the end of verse 2, but not before God. Those four simple words. He says it is not before God. He has no boasting to make before God. And friends, likewise with you, you have no good works to offer up to God. You are poor and miserable, miserable and wretched, just as I am by default. I, like you, am a poor beggar, but I have found the bread of life, which is nourishing to the soul. Friends, you must believe upon Christ. You must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not go through with this evil deed. I pastor a church not too far from here. And friends, I commit myself and my congregation to help you if you were to choose life. There are people waiting to adopt your child. There are people waiting to adopt that precious child, that gift from God. Scripture says that children are a gift from God. Allow me to help you. Allow my church to help you. Do not murder the innocent. For it says in Romans 3 that the wicked, concerning the wicked in verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Friends, you need to fear God and not do this thing. God will see to it that the wicked are punished. Please, abstain from this evil. Or you workers here who find employment at this den of demons, this house of death, you likewise need to flee and never look back. Never set foot in this place again. There is a holocaust going on in America, friends. Just as in Nazi Germany, Hitler was exterminating the Jews under the nose of the German people. We know that millions of people lost their lives in Nazi concentration camps in the Holocaust. And friends, there is a Holocaust happening in America, although the Holocaust which happened in Germany pales in comparison to the Holocaust that has been happening in America for generations. For millions and millions and millions of babies have been slaughtered on American soil. 3,000 a day die. Do not take part in this. Do not take part in this evil. Rather, repent and believe the Gospel. The Gospel which says that Christ died for sin according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures and that all who embrace Him are saved. Saved from sin. Saved from the wrath of God which is to come.
But going back to the text in Romans 4, Paul says in verse 3, For what does the Scripture say? So now he appeals to the highest authority concerning spiritual matters, that being the Word of God. It is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. These things that I speak to you concerning today are not from my own imagination or from the mind of men. They come from God. They are in the Word of God. They are in Scripture. These things are scriptural, friends. Scriptural. And so Paul likewise goes to the Scriptures. For he says, For what does the Scripture say? And then he quotes out of the book of Genesis, specifically in Genesis 15, 6, which says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. God gave Abraham a specific promise that he in his old age would bear a son and though in the mind of the fleshly man that seems like an impossibility, nonetheless Abraham took God at his word believing that what God was promising to him he was able to perform. Friends, likewise you must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ Believing that He died for your sin and that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day. Christ is a powerful Savior. A broad-shouldered Savior. He is the Redeemer of God's elect. And so I plead with you not to murder, but to believe upon Christ for life. He says, Abraham believed God. That is, that he was persuaded of this fact. That God is the Almighty God. And that whatever he says he can do, he can do. And that's what Paul later says in this very chapter. In verse 18 he says, In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Verse 19, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Friends, he was confident of this fact. Not that he was strong enough. Not even that his faith was able to save him. But the God in whom he placed his faith was able to save him. Was able to fulfill the promise he had given him concerning his son. See, his faith relied upon the strength, the power and the ability of God to do that which He promised. So should your faith be, my friends. Place your faith in the ability of Christ to save you, both from the effect of your sin, which will bring you hell, but also the power of sin in your own lives. For many of you are slaves to various lusts and pleasures, spending your lives in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, hating even your own children by killing them. Friends, you need to believe upon Christ. You need to repent. Jesus said, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You must understand this, friends. You must grasp this. Abraham believed God. And then it says, and it was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, God 
credited to Abraham a righteousness that was not his own. God looked upon Abraham as if he was righteous, as if he was holy. He regarded him as a pure man, though as we know, Abraham was like us, a sinner. Excuse me. Abraham was a sinner, just as we ourselves are. A weak man. But God regarded him as righteous. Why? Because of the righteousness of Christ. Because of the righteousness of the Son of God. Before Christ Himself had even been born, those many, many, many years, those many centuries before the Lord Christ had even been born, God credited to Abraham the righteousness that Christ Himself would one day procure through His perfect obedience to the law of God. Friends, Christ not only died for His people, but He Himself lived for them. He fulfilled the law. See, God's law demands of you that which you cannot provide. It demands of you perfect obedience. But can you provide it? Certainly not. I myself cannot. But Christ came in and fulfilled the law. He loved the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he loved his neighbor as himself. And for all who come to Christ, and even for all those who came to Christ before he had even been incarnated, They are credited with the righteousness of Christ. They are regarded as having lived Christ's life. Why? Because Christ was regarded as having lived their lives. Christ was regarded as having lived their lives. That is the great exchange that Christ takes upon Himself my sin and Abraham's sin. And Abraham in turn, and even I myself in turn, received the righteousness of Christ. We are seen as in Him by the Father, regarded as having performed perfectly, because Christ performed perfectly. This is the heart of the Gospel. This is what you must hang your hopes of glory upon, friends. If you are to enter into God's kingdom, you must be wrapped in the righteousness of His Son, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So look to Him. Look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. This God who justified Abraham. This God who granted to Abraham this faith which he had. For we know that it was not something that he conjured up. It was something that was granted to him from on high. This holy God is just that. He is holy. He is righteous and pure. The God who created the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. He is a just God. And He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Friends, Scripture clearly speaks to this. In Nahum chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And whirlwind and storm is His way, and clouds are the dust beneath His feet. Go down to verse 8. It says, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and he will pursue his enemies into darkness. That whatever you devise against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. God sees to it that the wicked are punished. It is true that God is patient, as we see in there in the beginning of verse 3. He is slow to anger. He is great in power. He is abounding in loving kindness and truth. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Christ commanded His disciples to love one another. 
But these attributes of God, these characteristics, do not stand in opposition to one another. They are not contradictory, as it were, but they are unified. God is unified. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The same essence, being in nature, yet three eternal persons, is fully unified. And that ought to cause you to fear. Because God is holy and He will punish sin. But think about the mercy of God, my friends, upon your lives. Think about the common grace that God has bestowed upon you. That this day you are here, breathing, living, your heart is beating. What a gift of grace from God that you had a vehicle to get here in. That you did not die in a car accident on your way here. And that even God in His providence has brought me out here today to plead with you concerning your souls. Think of the mercy of God, friends. And let that kindness that God has bestowed upon you and specifically that He has manifested in the Gospel. Let these manifestations of the kindness of God move you to repentance and break you over your sin. For God is holy. And God in His holiness has given His law, His Ten Commands, which I have spoken of a few times this morning. His law. You must understand the nature of God's law. See, it shows us God's standard. That standard by which we are judged. For we see in God's law that He says, You shall have no other gods before Me. That's in Exodus 20, verse 3. Go down to verse 13. You shall not murder, which again speaks to this issue of abortion. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Or put, other, put in another way, he is saying you shall not lie. He's forbidding lying. God's standard is a high standard. It is a perfect standard. We know that the law of the Lord is perfect. And it is the delight of the righteous man. God's law is perfect. Se habla en español. Oh, español. I apologize for the poor Spanish. Okay. Friends, but God's law is not only there to show us His standard, but to show us how we have fallen short of that. How we have utterly missed the mark. For what do we find? He says, you shall have no other gods before me. Oh, friends. Look at the gods which you worship. Money, pleasure, material possessions. Or even today, as you're setting out to murder your child, sacrificing them upon the altar of self, the altar of convenience, the altar of comfort. You do worship other things than the Lord God Almighty. Therefore, you have broken that command that God gave. You shall not murder. It would be superfluous for me to say again, but I must stress it. Friends, this is murder. Abortion is murder. And if you are to choose life today, friends, I offer myself and my church to do whatever is in our power to do to help you. Truly, I do. But this is serious. This is serious, friends. God says you shall not commit adultery. And not only adultery, but we know elsewhere in Scripture that any sexual immorality, pornography and fornication and homosexuality, these sins are abominable in the eyes of God. And you'll be damned for them, friends. The sin which you've committed against God is serious. Don't lose your soul over it. 
You shall not steal and you shall not lie. We have done those things. And I put myself in there with you as well. By default, I myself am a vile wretch needing the grace of God desperately. So we, all of us, all of mankind, are in a state of fallenness before God, of separation. We are at enmity and at war with God because we are by default born as God-haters. Not lovers of God, not neutral, but God-haters. And we live to sin against Him by default. And thereby, because of our sin, we are condemned to hell, to the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place that Jesus described as a place of outer darkness. As the place of an unquenchable fire. An unquenchable flame. I do not want you to go there. Hell is a real place. Matthew 25, 46 says that these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. The ungodly will go into eternal punishment. It never ends. The torments of the damned never end. Don't lose your soul, friends, over this sin, over any sin. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ and have life in Him. Have life in the Son of God. For there is one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. And so we are therefore helpless, hopeless. And we cannot, as I have said earlier, offer up to God any righteous deeds to somehow persuade Him to save us. For we have sin upon us. We may can present at least in our own minds, a thin veneer of holiness on the outside, a thin layer of supposed righteousness, but God's eyes see past such, and He sees the heart, and He sees that we are inwardly corrupt, bankrupt spiritually, as it were, therefore deserving of His holy wrath. But praise be to God that He is rich in mercy. He is rich in mercy, my friends. He has a great love for His people, for, for His specific people. It is an exclusive love. And before the world was made, He chose that people to Himself whom He would save. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. As Paul says in Ephesians 1, And before the world was made, He commissioned the Son. He covenanted, He entered into compact with Christ, the second person of the Trinity, concerning our souls. The conversation perhaps would have gone something to this effect. The Father spoke to the Son, Son, will you die for this poor lot, these miserable wretches? Will you suffer? the wrath that is due unto them? Will you fulfill the law on their behalf? If so, I will vindicate you and raise you from the dead and seat you at my right hand and you will receive the rewards of your sufferings. And Christ says, Yes, my Father, I will do it. I will suffer for the sins of my people for I have loved them with an everlasting love and I will draw them with my loving kindness. And so therefore, when the fullness of the times came, Christ came into the world. See, my friends, God is holy. He must see to it that sin is punished, and therefore there had to be a sin bearer. If God is to forgive the sins of His people, someone must pay the price for their sin, but it can be no man, no angel, no creature. It must be God Himself who can pay the infinite price. And so God Himself comes and pays the price. He fulfills the law on behalf of His people. He fulfills the law on behalf of His bride. As, I, as uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus here says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He kept the law. He fulfilled all righteousness. 
And then, in his humility, he laid himself down willingly to be beat and to be spat upon and nailed to that Roman cross outside of Jerusalem in Israel some 2,000 years ago. And upon that cross, the Father counted Him as a sinner. Though He was innocent and though He was perfect, the Father treated Him as a liar and a thief, as a blasphemer, as a murderer. Because His people had committed such vile sin and would commit such vile sin. And the Father credited to Christ's account the sins of all the elect of all the ages. And there He bore that in His body on the tree. And the wrath of the Father was unleashed upon Christ. He did not hold back. There was no abatement. The full fury of the eternal just wrath of God was put on Christ His Son. And He bore it and satisfied it. Jesus Himself said in Mark 15.34, it says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was as if the Father had forsaken Him upon the cross. The mercy, grace, and favor of God were for that time put away, and the justice of the wrath of God was unleashed and Christ satisfied it. He satisfied it upon the cross. Not an ounce left, not a drop left for the people of God. All of it gone. As Isaiah 53 10 clearly says, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. In other words, it's gone. His wrath is put away. It says, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it, that is the Father, and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. This, my friends, is the holiness, the mercy, the wrath, the love, the justice, the grace of God put on display. All of these attributes put together. They come, as it were, and meet in unison, in unity at the cross where Jesus died. And three days later, He rose from the dead. The Father vindicated Him. He rose Him up as the public display that He had received His sacrifice as the sufficient payment for sin. That there was not a drop of His wrath against the elect left. That Jesus had bought salvation. He had purchased redemption. So Christ is alive today, and He is alive forevermore. Praise be to God indeed. Blessed be God Most High forevermore. Amen. And 40 days later, my friends, Christ, Jesus Christ, ascended bodily into heaven, and He sat down in heaven. He was put at that exalted place in that exalted position at the right hand of the Father on high. As Hebrews 1.3 says, and, as, and He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ, my friends, is seated in heaven at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so, friends, the call of the gospel as Jesus says in Mark 1.15, is to repent and believe the gospel. Repentance is simply seeing that we have sinned against God, fleeing from it, endeavoring to flee from it. And then faith or belief is simply taking God at His word, as I said earlier. 
It is believing the gospel. Believing that what God has promised, what God has said concerning His Son is true, and what God has promised that He will do for those who come to His Son is true. Do you see that? Repentance and faith. You must respond in repentance and faith. However, these are gifts from God. They are not something you can conjure up. They're not something I myself can conjure up within me. They are divine gifts from God. For man is dead in sin. And so I know full well that only God can save you from your sin. Only God can. But for those who repent and believe the Gospel by the grace of God, are forgiven of their sin, as Jesus said in Luke 24. Forgiven of all sin, past, present, and future. Washed away, it is gone because of Jesus' death upon the cross, and they are wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. They are clothed in the garments of His righteousness. They are treated as if they lived His life. Why? Because He was treated as if He lived their life. As I said earlier, this is the glory of the Gospel. This is the beauty of it. That Jesus takes my sin away and in turn gives me His righteousness. So that the Father be bestows upon me this great gift, looks at me as in Christ. So the words of Romans 8.1 come to pass. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Friends, come to Christ. Do not abort your child. Do not slaughter your child. Do not come into this place and have a so-called doctor slaughter that innocent, precious child. Rather, repent of your evil and come to Christ for life. Salvation is all by grace. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved. It is of grace, unmerited favor, and not by the works of the law. And friends, for those who are saved, when God saves someone, when He gives them the gift of repentance and faith, He doesn't simply do that. He gives them a new nature likewise. He gives them a new heart with new desires, new intentions, new inclinations. They now hate the sin which they once loved, and they now love the God who they once hated. Do you see that? They no longer walk in sexual immorality and pride and lust and perversion. They no longer murder their children. They now walk in holiness, delighting in the Word of God and in prayer and in attending church and in obeying God's commandments. That's the nature of salvation. So if you claim to be a Christian and you're here this day and you live in blatant sin, and you do not bear good fruit, then I can assure you, you're not a Christian. How will you know? How do you know if you are converted? How do you know if you're a true Christian? Because God has done a work in your heart and has changed you, and therefore your life has been changed. It is not that we are justified by our work, but the work that we do, the fruit that we produce, shows us whether the profession of faith that we make is legitimate or not. The actions that we perform show us whether the words that we say are true or not. Do you see that, friends? Comprehend this, my friends. You must get this. True Christians bear the fruit of conversion. So, therefore, if you look at yourself and you see that you are unconverted, see that you're a hypocrite, the call is to repent and believe. But if so, if you are a Christian, well, praise be to God. If you are within an earshot of my voice in any direction, glorify God, my dear brethren. Walk in the truth of the Gospel. Rest in it. 
and go and feed upon it, yes, but then proclaim it to this lost and dying world, to your lost family members and friends. Plead with them to repent and to believe the gospel. The gospel is not only for the lost, but it is for the Christian. It is for the Christian. It is all by grace. Not by the works of the law, not by religious performance, but all of grace. Grace, grace, grace. John 1 says, For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. It is all by grace so that God might receive the glory. That is the purpose of this salvation. To bring God the glory. That is the purpose of all things. That is the purpose for which I come out here. Ultimately, it is to bring God the glory. As the author of Hebrews says at the end of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 2, or verse 20, excuse me, he says, Now the God of peace who brought up, Jesus, uh, brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant. Even Jesus our Lord equip you in every good thing to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ. To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen and amen. You lost souls. You unconverted people. You unbelievers. Repent and believe the gospel. Abandon your sin. Lay down your weapons, O sinner. And no longer strive against the Lord. Rather, submit to His rule and His reign over the universe. Submit to the triune God. For the sovereign Lord reigns. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. And whatever you devise against the Lord, He will make a complete end of it. You who name the name of Christ, Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Look at your life. Do you walk in righteousness? If not, you need to be converted. And you fit under the first category of people whom I just addressed. However, if you are in Christ, as mentioned a moment ago, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. And go and make Christ known. Rest upon the gospel by the grace of God and proclaim His name. Proclaim the gospel of Christ to this lost world. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 4 and verses 1 through 3 that Abraham was justified by faith. Abraham was converted by believing the promises of God. We have seen that God is holy righteous and pure and he gave his law his ten commands but we ourselves have broken them for he said you shall not steal or lie but we have trampled them underfoot and therefore all mankind is condemned to hell but God is rich in mercy friends and he sent his son into the world to bear his wrath against the sins of his people and he rose him up three days later Christ is alive today and the call is the call of the gospel is for sinners to repent and to believe it and they will be forgiven of sin by grace. By God's amazing, redeeming grace. They will be given new hearts with new desires. All by His grace. And all for His glory. So to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit, to the one true God be all glory in all things forevermore. Amen and amen.